Hi guys, welcome to another hot seat with Priscilla K. My name is Priscilla Kuma as always. If you're new here, subscribe and stay. If you're already here, thanks for coming again. Today I have another guest on the show. But before that, let me give a shout out to two very important people. Thank you, Celeste Sosoy, for sharing my videos every time. Thank you, Nanayao. I really appreciate it. Keep sharing, keep doing the good work. I gave a shout out to a friend of mine the other time, Alaji Rabiu, and today he's here with us. He's going to introduce himself and tell us all about what he's doing. So stay back, watch, subscribe, share, leave comments below, and I'll see you on the other side. Hi, Alaji Rabiu. Welcome to the whole city of Slake. Hello, thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be here. Nice. How are you doing? Not bad. How is it up there in the States? We're in Ghana and we're, we're getting ready for the hammer times. And I'm sure, you know, you are getting ready for the winter as well. That's right. We're getting ready for the winter. And um, it's post-elections and virus is rising. So it's kind of chaotic right now, but we're managing. So glad to have you here. I am too. <laughs> Can you please introduce yourself? Well, um, my name is Alaj Rabiu Modi. Rabiu Modi, really. Um, I'm, a, I'm a social entrepreneur and um, I'm a family man. I'm a community person. And yes, I'm a, I'm a youth enthusiast, actually. I like to empower young people and um, pretty much that's why. Yes, I know about your youth empowerment. We're going to come to that very soon. So aside that, what do you do for a living? Well, basically, I was born into a family of entrepreneurship. Um, I, I do Forex. I do a lot of investments in small businesses. And then, um, yes, basically, now I'm going into the upstream oil market. Nice. Oil, manage, oil management or oil money. Did I hear that right? Oil markets. Downstream market. oil markets. Okay. I'm interested in all of that, but can we talk about Forex? What is Forex? I, I see people doing Forex trading a lot these days. Is it safe to do? What is Forex trading? So Forex is foreign exchange. That is shortened to Forex. Okay. So any exchange between two currencies is Forex exchange or is, or is foreign currency exchange. So as long as there's globalization, there's the need for goods and services to move from one country to another, there will be an exchange of currencies. If you are buying goods from China or I'm importing stuff from America, I need to pay my suppliers in the, in the currency of their origin. Definitely, I would have to convert my dynasty to that supplier's currency. So by that doing, there is a foreign exchange between my my country currency and then the currency from which the goods are coming so definitely there's a forex what happens is that forex rates are determined by demand and supply so the demand and supply parameters between um, the trade between maybe usa and ghana um, and also other factors will determine what the value is there are countries that have and fixed exchange rate regimes. There are other ones that we leave it to the markets to determine where the rates will be. In a free and in a free capitalistic market like that of Ghana, it is the free exchange regime that, that we use. So that means the, the rates for foreign currencies are determined by demand and supply forces. Unlike in other countries, like in the Gulf regions where the currencies are fixed. So for, for 10 years, the dollar to the Dirham, which is the currency of the United Arab Emirates, has been at 376. It's been there from 10 years ago since that moment. But yes, foreign, foreign currency exchange, knowing that there's business between two countries and there's exchange of goods and services between two countries, is definitely going to be an avenue for foreign exchange. So there are people that are there that know these dynamics, that know the things that affect the movement of these currencies, and they take it as their day job either buy a certain currency in bulk, then trade it to get the other currency where there's certain arbitrage or a difference and they make money out of it. So that is foreign currency exchange. And how long have you been a forex, forex trader? Well, um, as I said, I was born in it. Um, yes. Most of my uncles owned the, the local forex bureaus. 
Ghana. There are offices where people used to bring money or they bring foreign currencies to give, get Ghana City. Or if you wanted to buy foreign currency when you're leaving the country, you walk into a foreign bureau and you buy. My uncles, you know, in the early 90s, when the Bank of Ghana gave licenses for foreign bureaus to operate in Ghana, they were one of the earliest to acquire them. So they did acquire, acquire quite a lot. And then my mom also, you know, acquired a license. So when I was in secondary school, I used to go intern there. That is where I learned um, foreign currency exchange. So there has to be some 20 odd years since I, I started foreign currency exchange. Nice. I know you went to tech, KNUST back in Ghana. And after that, you went straight into establishing your own business. Is right. that correct? Right. So um, the whole business, because I was, for a long time, I was already in it. Um, I used, as I say, I take risks. I take advantages of wherever I find myself to see if there's a business avenue. Then I tap into it and then I, I, I do some investment do some research and then some investment into it. So I remember even before I went to KNUST, I was doing some little businesses in Makola, you know, buying and selling of goods that were in demand or were short. And when I went to KNUST, um, I went and saw an opportunity of, um, of handouts and, and how people were struggling to get their photocopies done here and there. So I spoke to my mother and got a loan buy a photocopier where I put it at the vantage points where I could then photocopy through people's um, notes and then make some money out of it. So in less than three months, I was able to pay her back and then I owned the copier. I was able to buy another one. So I put them one at um, the academic site and one at the domestic site. You know. So whilst I was still doing tech, um, whilst I was still doing photocopy, I was also and getting the chance to travel out to England and work during the vacation. So um, I did a lot of, as Legon people will say, any work, you know, from all sorts, you know, from um, the cleaning, to the construction, the um, security, to hotel, you know, it's just what any young man will do to, to look after himself and then do some shopping and buy some other things to come and sell into. So I've had this entrepreneurial mindset. And also, as I said, my environment was very encouraging of entrepreneurship. Everyone in my family was sort of not in formal employment. And so that sort of gave me the impetus to want to be also an entrepreneur. And I think that your orientation from the start really determines where you go. If you're born in a family where most of um, most of your of your of your family were civil servants, then you probably will look to do civil service. But if you were born in a family where most of them were engineers, sort of grew up into it, and then you know you're able to pick certain traits and attributes that will help you. You just took the words out of my mouth. I was coming to ask you that: Do you think those around you shaped you to do? What you're doing but you've already said it so that's very good so what do i need as a lay person to be a forest trader if i have some money and i want to invest it is it a good business well i think i think that in everything that you do there's a difference between having a job and having a career okay. um a job is something that you do because you have to do it and that will pay your bills mm -hmm. a career is something that you do willingly that you enjoy doing, that you don't feel really stressed doing, and it still gives you joy and you still make money out of it. I try to advise young people to have careers in that you're able to grow into your career whilst you are still making a decent wage out of it. So to do Forex, I think that in the first place, you should develop a certain kind of interest for it. You should be worried. You should start learning about the things that contribute to Forex exchanges. You should you should be interested in economics. You should be interested in finance. You should be interested in, you know, global affairs because everything that happens in the world has a, has a direct effect on what happens wherever you are. So the recent U.S. elections has a dramatic effect on the stock exchange. If you look, you see that the, the stocks are going down. And in other places, the U.S. currency is losing um, its strength because if investments are made in U.S. currencies, and there's an election because investors do not 
who are not very sure what the outcome will be, they would like to move their investments into safer havens such as gold and other minerals. So that will affect, you know, the, the, the stocks and also the, the weight of the currents. So you should be able to, you should be interested in all of these things, in politics, in economics, worldly affairs, because they have a dramatic effect on where the exchange rates are. So you can start, it depends, there are two, there are two ways. The, the, the traditional one is what I spoke to you about, where you have an actual building, where you get a license from Bank of Ghana to trade as a forex trader, where you buy and sell currencies over the counter. There are other methods where you can be a broker between institutions, large institutions, corporate institutions, where you can broker to import um, forex on their behalf um, or sell forex to them using a bank as an intermediary. Or you can join an online platform that uses um, online trading methods to buy or exchange currencies in large volume. So that is the, the current online foreign exchange. That one, the regulator is not really um, than your local Bank of Ghana regulator, but there are financial institutions that regulate the actions of those bodies. And then you will join in as a member and you have your regulation there as well. So there are different kinds. It depends on your interest and then your risk appetite as well. You know, then you decide which one works. Yes, you mentioned risk appetite. Some of us are not risk takers. We're always afraid to invest money in all these things especially nowadays that all these companies are collapsing here and there, gold investments, Bitcoin here and there. So we don't know which ones are really safe to venture into and the fear of losing your investment. I know taking a business, taking a risk, you're taking a risk when you're investing, but how, how safe are we to invest in these things? Because most of them are collapsing these days. Well, to be honest with you, I always tell young investors that do not invest in anything you don't understand. I mean, Warren Buffett said to um, Mark Zuckerberg that I, I do not want to invest in things because I don't understand it. If you put your money and where you don't understand how the money is supposed to work and you're just in there for the greed and for the return that you've been promised, it's quite problematic. You should be able to know what the money you give or invest is going to be used for, how it is going to generate money for you, what level of risk are you taking? Because there's a direct relationship between the level of risk and then the level of return. And if you are risking a high amount, your return is high, then there's a high possibility that you could lose all your funds as well. So um, if you are not a, you are risk averse, there are many instruments that you can engage in. You can go for the government of Ghana treasury bills. Um, the, the risk is, is measured in, in, uh, in a unit called beta. So we can see that government of Ghana treasury bills have a beta of zero. It means that the risk levels are quite low. Obviously, because it's government backed, there's no way the government of Ghana will renege on paying your interest when it is due. And because Ghana is a going concern, that means it's a country in progress. There's no way at any point in time where a government will say, that owe me and I'll not pay you back. So because the risk is less, the return is also less as compared to bonds or stocks of individual companies. So depending on your risk appetite, you can go for risk-free or less riskier um, elements like, um, like treasury bills or mutual funds where a group of people pull up their money and then they, they put it in a pot, you know, and they, they, they then the fund managers then diversify the use of those monies into sectors that are varied and diverse, so that even if there's a loss in one of one of the sectors, other sectors will buffer it and your loss will be minimized. So there are those mutual funds there. There are a few companies that have those mutual funds. There's um, Echo Bank, there's Standard Chartered Bank. There are other banks that also have it. There's, um, um, so you can look at those. But if you want to be riskier, then you want to look at companies that uh, have listed on the Ghana Stock Exchange or any other stock exchange um, in the world. They, have, they offer higher um, rates of return, but also it is riskier because the, the weight of the investment is equal to the, the amount, or what do they call it, the turnover that the companies are making and the profit margins that the, profit are, and the companies are making. So if they are making losses, then 
the value of the stock will go down and it will affect you know, your stocks as well. So everything is risk appetite. You need to learn as much as possible in those spaces and then make informed decision. You should be able to speak to experts that can give you insights into some of these things and then they can help you with where to put your money. I mean, recently, you've heard about cryptocurrency, you've heard about blockchain technology, all of that. There are all different markets that are emerging and that are taking out the regular financial services industry. This is seen to be the next big thing in the financial services industry. That will take away physical money exchanges, things like that, and bank transfers that we've known them to be. So currently, um, many companies are accepting blockchain technology in terms of Ethereum, in terms of Bitcoin, in terms of Litecoin, um, as modes of payment. PayPal never used to be there. Um, you know, Zelle, all these things that never used to be there, now they are accepted as modes of payment. So people are seeing that as the next big thing in the financial services industry. And it's important as an investor, you need to be abreast with some of these things so that, you know, you take advantage of them. Wow. So basically, we need to be abreast with what is going on. We need to be reading all the time to be able to ask the right questions and know what we are investing into. Most of us just want the higher returns. So we don't go for the governmental ones. We go for these ones that spring up because you get 200% interest and it moves you. So I'm glad you've given us the basic information we need, to, we need to know. Can you tell me a little bit about your background? Are you Ghanaian and which part of Ghana are you coming from? I know you have a little bit of Nigerian link. Can you talk about that, please? So about 150 years ago, my great grandparents migrated from Northern Ghana to come do and trade, you know, in Ghana. So they were dealing in Kula. And if you quite remember, the hinterland, the middle part of the country from the eastern region all the way to Ashanti and Brongahafu had some really huge Kula farms. And then um, Kula was then very important and, and staple, you know, that was used in the Kula, um, Kula industry, you know, in beverages and other things. So they were exporting these to other West African countries and also into, into Europe and things like that. So my great-grandparents migrated to the central part of Accra, where it's called Gamashi now, yeah. and, and then settled there. There were other people, there were other tribes there, so they sort of formed the Hausa chieftaincy. So at the moment, they are heirs to the Hausa chieftaincy in Accra. So generations after generations, my grandparents were born here in Ghana, my, my parents were born here in Ghana, and I was born here in Ghana as well. So I'll say I'm fourth generation Ghanaian, and um, I've, been, I've been a proud Ghanaian since then. But we still hold our heritage, Hausa people, intact. You know, we do our festivals, we do all our, you know, traditional things. We keep in touch with our folks back in Nigeria. It's such a healthy relationship. Nice. So I know you are a lot into charity work, especially in the Zungo community of Ghana. Can you tell us all about your charity work? And Right. So I always I, I say that I, I was quite privileged. As I said, my, my grandparents were educated. My parents were educated. When at the time of their education, it was abhorred because they thought that, you know, by going to school, you'd be Christianized. So many Muslim families did not take their kids to school. I was lucky. My 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 parents were educated, so we got you know very very good education invested into us. So um, I go to Islamic school over the weekend in the community where I grew up, Accra Newtown, Kutubabi Nima, and I realized that I'm very very privileged. I see a lot of people that are struggling economically and financially in terms of education. And then I come back to my community and I realize, what can I do to make a difference? How can I change the status quo, you know, so that I can uplift the many that did not have the same privileges as I did? That informs my passion for community work. And also, I grew up in a family where giving is the order of the day. My, my family house in Accra always has people that, that are always getting during Ramadan, during festivals, during big salah, we have people that don't have them, they come and we share with them 
you know, during Ramadan, people come and they have eaten the same thing. So I sort of learned it from an early age um, as um, that giving is better than receiving, and it's been a part of me, and I enjoy sharing as much as I have been giving to other people who are less privileged. Nice. So what are some of the works you've done in the community and what else are you currently working on? Right. So Yes, yeah, so we have we have um, a group called Zombo Inspiration Team where um, the Zombo Inspiration Team basically deals with young people in schools. We um, do mentorship, we do career guidance and counseling, we help them, um, we help people, or young people in public schools to get a little better education than what they're getting. And so we organize quizzes, we organize seminars where we teach them report writing, writing skills, storytelling, um, and then we organize quizzes where they teach amongst themselves and it helps them improve in their, their study methods and even in their examinations like the BC as well. We started this four years ago and within the IASO sub-district we've improved um, results of BEC of about six, seven schools for the past five years. Very, very commendable. We've helped young people to get scholarships um, from public schools into um, tertiary institutions and then um, you know, aside that, we also collaborate with other institutions that offer um, career guidance or entrepreneurship guidance, business support, um, like the Zombovation Hub, where young people are taught to code, young, uh, young business women are taught to run proper business, giving them um, tutorials on marketing, financial knowledge, bookkeeping and accounting. On my, and on a lot of on a lot, lots of um, areas as well, and I'm part of those boards. So um, we give what we can, what we what we learn to school. Impact. So far, it hasn't been bad at all. The turnout has been good, and I'm seeing a marked improvement in the output. That is all what volunteering and community work is about. When you see real change, people getting better as a result of your actions, and you know you get proud of yourself that you're actually doing something. I'm very privileged to know you and call you my friend. You're very kind and I've seen some of the works you've done. Do you have any political career or uh, intentions to be in the political arena? I think that it's important. Um, the last time I was speaking to a group of young people, I told them that if we really want to make strides in our community, there are three areas where we need to champion. And it is one, politics, two, education, three, um, proper business and hard work. If um, you want to make strides, you can make strides in terms of businesses where you employ a lot of young people and you, know, you put money in their pockets. The other thing where you can add value to yourself and society is to educate yourself as much as you can so that you can be a torch where people can look up to you and then they can follow suit. When we get a lot more educated, Folks, then we, we are called upon on the decision table to also make our inputs when, when things regarding us are concerned. The last part where, whether you like it or not, your life is influenced is by politicians. Politicians influence what we do, what we wear, what we listen to, what, what, and, and all of that. So I think that getting into the political space helps to change the narrative as well. As of now, I haven't made my mind to join any political party as yet. But in my small way, I think that conscientizing young people to, to, to be aware of themselves and get interested in the affairs of the country on all levels, the district level and the constituency level, and the regional and national and even international level, that conscientism is in itself politics. So um, that is where we are at the moment. I think that when we drive the young people and, and take personal responsibility of their life, it's as equal as a politician standing on a podium and doing the same. So you are, you are leading but from behind. Instead of taking a top down of you are doing it bottom up. That, I, that in itself, I think, is politics. It might not be party, but it's politics. 
Yes, it is. You are changing lives, impacting life positively, and that is very commendable.